moguls were, if I may use a very modern language, thrilled about it because they had found it to be a real uh, encumbrance, you know. So that's where we stopped. So today, this is what we'll do, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, uh, and the Marathas. Uh, and with the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, the Mughal Empire doesn't come to an end uh, formally, but he is considered to be the last of the great Mughal emperors. Um, and we're not going to really look at the remaining emperors because there are no real significant accomplishments taken as a whole, uh, because obviously there are thousands of details of Indian history that we are not looking at, and 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 in a sense the Mughals will start to fade away. But but there are imp interesting characters who will reappear in my narrative from time to time, particularly the last Mughal emperor, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, in in the mid 1800s when the British are going to uh, inflict uh, a great defeat on the rebels. Uh, and with the death of uh, the last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the Mughal empire formally comes to an end. So you, some history books will tell you the Mughal empire comes to an end in 1858, which is technically correct. Uh, but other books will tell you that effectively it came to an end in 1707, uh, which is correct as well. That's what I'm suggesting to you because uh, Orang, with the death of Orang, say they go into a decline. Uh, you can also take a middle date of mid 1700s and say that that's actually when it really came to an end because from 1707 to 1757, the Mughal Empire is still there. The British still have to think about them. But when we get to uh, the next lecture, where we'll start looking at the East India Company, um, and you know its origins in India, how did it begin, uh, what kind of trade they did and all of that, and then move into the 1700s, then I think you'll begin to see why, uh, uh, you know, stopping at Aurangzeb is quite sensible a decision, okay? So uh, Shah Jahan, few observations. Um, and here again, we're going to only look at a few highlights. Uh, recall that in the case of uh, Jahangir, I talked about his love of painting. Um, I talked about his love of uh, uh, gardens, um, but you don't really get great architectural works. Uh, in the case of Shah Jahan, you'll get, you'll get great architectural works. All right, so some of the most significant buildings uh, especially from the tourist standpoint, if I may put it this way, um, really go back to the reign of Shah Jahan. Um, in the case of Akbar, uh, we saw patronage of uh, certainly architecture. Many of the great forts were built at that time. Uh, uh, Fatehpur Sikri, of course, we saw patronage of uh, painting, uh, not so much interest in gardens. Right, so it varies from one emperor to another. In the case of Shah Jahan, uh, I think painting is certainly important as well, uh, patronage of painting, uh, but architecture is probably the, the most enduring legacy from his uh, reign, uh, which is from 1628 uh, until 1658. Um, when he's not going to die, when he's going to be, we'll get to that story, he's going to be, he's going to be uh, put in jail, uh, imprisoned by his, uh, by his own son, right? So there's going to be a dispute, uh, uh, a bitter battle over the, uh, over the throne, who's going to ascend to the throne. Um, and we'll see Aurangzeb emerge triumphant from that. Now, when he came to his uh, position, as emperor, he didn't come uh, as a novice. Uh, it was common, uh, this is something you had asked me a question in the previous session and, and here is a different way to put it. Uh, you know, uh, how much experience in a way did these, did these princes have uh, before they took over the throne? Uh, so in the case of Shah Jahan, he's appointed governor of Deccan. Um, and uh, this you can see is considerably before uh, the time that he actually assumed the throne. So, you know, when, they, when the sons of the emperor are 16, 17, 18, um, some of them are already 
in the battlefield. Uh, they may even be asked to take over uh, to lead a campaign. Uh, there would be, of course, senior generals there to guide uh, the prince. Uh, and some of them were appointed uh, governors of various provinces. So they're ruling on behalf of the emperor. In this case, uh, he's ruling on behalf of his father, right? Um, and, and if there's more than one son, uh, then what's happening is that there's going to be uh, a, a division of uh, the power. So one son may be appointed to one particular place, another one to another place. Um, and again, you'll see, you'll see how that works out shortly. So the gist of it here is that he comes with the experience of having been governor of Deccan, South India, for a short period of time, governor of Bihar, uh, here we're talking about, you know, cent, um, you know, Eastern India, but but Central Eastern India, uh, Gujarat, Western India. He's governor of that, 1614 to 18. Then he's at, then he's with his, uh, uh, then he's at the court um, in Delhi from 1623 to 27. And then uh, for a portion of that time, he's also sent to Bengal, and he's also sent to Bihar. All right. So, is point is, that he had, huh? sorry, he was governor of all these places. Yeah, but these are these because basically what is what, what's happening is that he's been he's been given administrative experience by his father, right? His father is basically giving giving him administrative experience, moving him around, uh, and you know, and to understand why one place at one point in time, then we'd have to really, you know, look at much great much greater detail, right? Which <clears throat> is not what the purpose of uh, our intellectual exercise here is. Now, uh, he responds to what I'm calling the revivalist movement among Muslims by being more sensitive to the Sharia. Let me explain very briefly. So you recall, of course, that his, that, that, uh, um, uh, his grandfather, um, that is Akbar, had in fact, uh, 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 you know, uh, got into the got into his court, uh, people of different religious persuasions and different religious sensibilities. So you, you you remember the whole discussion. There is even a building at Fatehpur Sikri, which is a kind of a place that is dedicated to religious discussions. Uh, Akbar brought to his court, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of Muslims, and then he expands the discussion to include Hindus and Jesuits. And I'd mentioned to you that there's a, a vigorous sort of, uh, uh, how should I put it, a vigorous uh, intellectual effort to make available the intellectual legacy of India to the Mughals. And here by India, I mean Hindu India, that is that the Mughals were interested. All right. Now Jahangir, Shah Jahan's father had continued that to a substantial degree. And so the Muslim clergy is getting very unsettled. I mean, and they're very unsettled, particularly by, by Akbar, because uh, Akbar had created a cult uh, uh, of himself, the, the, where he himself is beginning to be worshipped as God. Uh, and you recall that discussion I had that the, you know, when Muslims say, Allah Akbar, uh, God is great, uh, uh, the way that Akbar had common people try to interpret that is, is to say that actually Akbar is God. It's not just that, Al, because the word Akbar, okay, uh, is his name, but it also means, uh, uh, as in Allah Akbar, the great one, okay? So here, there's concern about the Muslims, uh, clergy that uh, multiple concerns. One that that Akbar and his son Jahangir, to, but to a lesser degree, but still to a substantial degree, that they both moved away from uh, Orthodox Islam. A lot of the practices they're engaged in uh, are un-Islamic. One of those practices I had discussed, where the emperor comes out uh, on the balcony uh, and presents himself. Okay, uh, so this is this is a, the the Hindu practice of darshan. So uh, you know to and again I've spoken about darshan before, but darshan is a key element of Hindu worship, 
uh, and Hindu devotion. Uh, so when you when when a Hindu goes to a temple, uh, one of the things they want to, is they want to be able to get a darshan, that is, be able to see the deity. Right? You see the deity, and of course, the deity is seeing you. Right? Uh, when you see the deity, you get uh, filled with the love of God. It gives you immense satisfaction. All right. I mean, I and and uh, I'll give you a, a a small story so you understand the signif significance of this. So when I was fourteen years old, um, I remember being taken to Vaishnav Devi. Now Vaishnav Devi is uh, this uh, uh, you know pilgrimage site uh, where the goddess. Um, uh, is uh, there's a, a murti, an image of her, and it's in a cave. And this is, you know, this is in Kashmir. Now you have to, it's a long ways off from Delhi. Uh, the, it takes a while to get there. And, and you know, you can't go there entirely by train. You know, at some point you have to, you have to walk, uh, et cetera. Okay. And, and I'm talking here now about 19... 74 or 75, I think it was. I don't remember the exact date when, when I was taken there. And, you know, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of people lined up already when you get there to, to get the darshan of the goddess. And what is the goddess? It's, it's just really a murti, an image inside a cave. And I know that when our turn came, uh, and, you know, I was 14, I was entirely wholly uninterested in religion, but I'd been taken there by my parents, uh, who frankly were not very devout, but there was like a group of people going, they said, okay, well, let's see what it's all about, right? And, you know, it's like this long, arduous journey, and then you're rushed into this cave, and these pujaris, the priests are pushing you, you know, and you literally have like a minute, and then you're pushed out, all right? But, but for the real devotee, it's enough. You've seen the image of the goddess or the god. That's a darshan, okay? And there's a very elaborate explanation of all of its meanings, which we don't need to enter into here. What was happening that Akbar was, was, had taken over this practice and he allows the people to have this gaze, this view of him. What he's also conveying to them is, hey, the ship of the state is afloat, meaning I'm coming out to the window, to the balcony, I'm standing here, I'm showing myself to you, to the thousands of you who are gathered here. You can see the country is running well. I'm up and about, right? So that's what I mean by the ship of the state is afloat, okay? But it's a Hindu practice, this idea of darshan. So what I'm saying is that there are lots of things that are giving the Muslim clergy anxiety. Okay, now Shah Jahan, and, and this, so there's this revivalist movement, Muslims were saying, now we need to try to see if we can have the country get back on a more regular Islamic path as it were, right? Uh, he responds to the popular pressure by be, being more sensitive to the Sharia, Shah Jahan. Okay, so he's going to celebrate Muslim festivals with great vigor. Uh, he's going to support the pilgrimage to Mecca. So when, when we say support the pilgrimage to Mecca, Mecca, it means, for example, because you might legitimately ask yourself, well, tangibly, what did it mean in real terms? What it means is that, for example, if there are 500 Muslim women uh, who are elderly uh, in the city of Agra, and they belong to an organization, and they'd like to go to Mecca, and, and they don't have the money to do it, the emperor says, I'll support, I'll support your pilgrimage, because, you know, this is one of the things that a devout Muslim is supposed to do, uh, one, at least once in their lifetime, the pilgrimage to Mecca. So, Shah, in other words, it's a state sponsoring a religious activity, that if you translate it into a different language, right? It's a state sponsoring religious activity because the emperor is the state, right? He's also going to impose restrictions on the repair and construction of Hindu temples and churches. Now this shouldn't be taken too literally. That is, that is it's, it's, it's not that there's a ban on, the, on 
Hindu temples, Jain temples, and Christian churches. Uh, but it's going to be harder to find patronage. So what the Muslim emperors, uh, the Mughal emperors did, uh, Akbar, Jahangir, you know, if you have a great Hindu temple and it's falling in disrepair, it needs to be, it needs some renovation. Uh, they would put the money into it. And we know all of this because of detailed records that have been left behind, some of which I spoke to you about, you know, I spoke to you about the Tuzuke Jangri, for example, the, you know, the memoir from his time, there are lots of other sources. Uh, and in the case of Akbar, there's obviously not, you know, the, 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 the Akbar Nama uh, and the Aine Akbari, which I had mentioned to you uh, by Abu Fazl. And there are, of course, many other sources too. Uh, uh, and in fact, some of the, the some of the Mughal record keeping is very detailed, uh, uh, because, for example, how do we know how much money was spent uh, building the Taj Mahal? Well, we 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 have, you know, the account books. Okay, uh, so we have a pretty good idea uh, of how much money was spent, how many people were employed, uh, all of that. All right. Uh, now, um, given what I've said to you before, um, I think you're familiar with that point of view, namely that uh, at the end of the day, let's not forget that the uh, Mughal emperors are dedicated to the, to the job of uh, expanding their empire, obviously maintaining what they have and expanding it. So given that, you can expect that Shah Jahan, uh, like his predecessors and like, his, like the people who follow him, is going to be engaged uh, a good deal of the time in either warfare or in planning alliances with other states, what today would be called foreign policy, right? He's, he's doing all of that as well. But, but under Shah Jahan, the Mughal Empire is not going to grow really. It's going to remain where it is. And then it's only going to be under his son Aurangzeb uh, that the empire will grow uh, tremendously to what becomes its maximum uh, range um, under any Mughal uh, emperor. Uh, so for example, he is going to make several attempts to, to uh, uh, acquire Kandahar, uh, which you're now familiar with, you know, in Afghanistan, much further west. Um, but despite various attempts, he is not able to dislodge the Safavids, that's the Persians uh, who had gained control of Kandahar. Uh, now, 20% of the imperial elite at the court. So these are the these are the people who are in attendance at the court, the great officers of the state, the generals, the nobles, the nobility, right? Uh, and 20% of the imperial elite were Hindus, mainly Rajputs, some Marathas. We'll get to the Marathas later on today. Uh, but that at least gives you some idea that it's not only all Muslims. And remember that the Muslims are actually from many different parts of India and even abroad. Uh, although what Akbar had started to do, and this was a policy that was maintained by Jahangir, um, uh, is increase the Indian element, right? That's, that's what we're really talking about. Now, um, he's going to have the peacock throne built, uh, exceedingly famous, of course. The peacock throne, if, if, which is going to be taken away from India uh, by Nadir Shah when he's going to invade India, uh, you know, a hundred years later. Uh, the peacock throne at that time cost 10 million rupees. Uh, and, 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 and when I say 10 million rupees, it's basically the cost of. Uh, jewels, which is about 8.6, 8.5 million, and another 1.5 million of gold uh, that we're talking about. And again, I won't get into the details of that because you know what I've mentioned to you that every Mughal history has pages on jewels and diamonds and rubies and all of that, right? Uh, he commissions the Pacha Nama. I'm giving you a few highlights, all right, from, from his reign. Uh, he commissions a Pachanama, which is a history of his reign. Uh, this work is important because it's one of the one of the most gorgeous um, albums uh, of miniature paintings um, that have been produced. So the 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 
uh, workshops that Akbar had set up. Uh, you know, the art workshops, these are going to be maintained at the Mughal court, and this is where this work is going to be executed, um, the Pachanama, all right? Um, so those are some of the highlights. Now, uh, uh, the building that is most well known for is, of course, the Taj Mahal, which we're going to, I'm going to look at its cultural history, um, in some detail. And here, uh, here uh, what you're going to hear is my distinctive style, which I think you have now probably surmised to some degree, which is that I don't only really look at, you know, the sort of the facts as we know them, uh, but I try to do a different kind of cultural history, uh, which requires some work of interpretation. So in this case, for example, we would have to ask ourselves, well, um, what is the place of the Taj Mahal in the imagination of the country, for example, right? I mean, if you had to, if you had to ask, I think you would agree with me without any question whatsoever, that if you asked any person outside India, name me one Indian building that you know of, or one building in India that you know of, the first answer will be the Taj Mahal, right? Everyone's heard of the Taj Mahal. Everyone wants to go there. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the classic tourist photograph uh, is the photograph of the tourist in front of the Taj Mahal, you know, with his or her spouse or lover or friend or children, whatever it is. And, and, and you know, if you've been to American homes or British homes or someone's been there very often, they'll have a frame painted photograph of them in front of the Taj. So it is the most iconic building. It, it's a building that stands for India. Um, in many ways, um, but it has a very interesting and complicated history, which comes down to the present day in many ways, right? Uh, there's, there are now very detailed studies done uh, about the Taj, uh, but, there are, but there are important questions of a kind that common people will seldom ask, right? Uh, and one of those questions is how was the building financed? How was the building of the Taj Mahal financed? Now this tomb, which is what it is, it's a tomb because it's a, it's a mausoleum, uh, uh, a tomb where the dead are buried. But, uh, in this case, Mumtaz Mahal, that is the, the beloved wife of Shah Jahan, uh, and then Shah Jahan who dies after she dies, uh, he's buried there as well. There are also some other uh, graves of other people in the family, you know, all right? Um, so it's a tomb. Um, <clears throat> and if, uh, from the floor to the very top of the tomb, the height is that of a modern 20-story building. Now, um, how was it built? Uh, you know, th th that obviously would require you want to look at the architectural plans and all of that. When I'm in, it takes about 20, 22 years. Some people say 2019, uh, 22 is, is very often mentioned. Uh, and roughly about 20,000 men who worked on this building. So you're, you can imagine, right? 22 years, 20,000 laborers. I mean, that's an enormous number of uh, people. If you're just counting the number of work hours, I mean, you're running into millions, right? Uh, there's a very great uh, historian, uh, Irfan Habib, who says, amidst the complexity of the arrangements for assessment and collection of the revenue, one major aim of the Mughal administration still stands out, the attempt at securing the bulk of the peasants surplus. Right? Now, what is the relevance of this to the Taj and what, what is meant by Irfan Habib? That there's been quite a lot of work done on the, the revenue arrangements and the revenue administration of the, of the Mughal, Mughal administration, right? How did they handle questions of revenue? Where did they get revenue? What is the main source of revenue? The main source of revenue is uh, obviously going to be taxation of land, uh, the tax, but there'll be also, also taxes on goods, on trade. Uh, when the East India Company wants to trade, uh, they have to pay a certain amount of money, for example. We're talking about relatively small sums here, but that's an illustration of where the Mughal emperor, uh, Mughal emperor would derive his revenue from, right? <clears throat> now, Irfan Habib is a Marxist historian. 
And so therefore what he's emphasizing here uh, is the fact that really it was the peasants who were squeezed out uh, of, of their money. So whenever there was surplus and surplus effectively simply means that if a, let's say you have a, a peasant and the pe pe peasant has uh, got a family of 10 people, he's producing enough uh, to be able to feed the family of 10 for the whole year uh, and maybe meet a few other needs from that. Anything beyond that is quote surplus, right? And Irfan Habib's claim, same, claim is that the Mughal emperor attempted to secure the bulk of this surplus, that this was what would come to the Mughal empire. At least that's what the Mughal emperor wanted. Um, uh, so what he's suggesting is that when you're looking at the revenue sources, what you're really talking about is exploitation. That's what, that's what he really means, right? So the principal source was a jagir or revenue assessment of a no noble. So, uh, so you know, when you had, so let's say a person um, ha is is uh, is appointed to the throne. Uh, I mean, appointed to the court, uh, a great nobleman. Uh, let's say a Rajput who's been defeated in battle, and instead of being killed, as I mentioned to you, that what the Mughals do is they absorb this person into the empire. Uh, now, very often that they would actually confer a jagir. Jagir is a gift of land, right? Gift of land. Uh, the person who who is conferred this gift of land is the jagir dar. Uh, uh, the same ending d a r as in the word zamindar. Zamindar is a landlord. Uh, that word is still used in India frequently, uh, and sometimes it's used to refer just to. Uh, a landlord and uh, you know rural areas uh, more generally, uh, but a zamindar is someone who is basically uh, owns acres of land. Okay, right. So a jagir dar, jagir is a gift of land, and then you have this the, the there is a revenue assessment placed on that land. Okay, and portion of this revenue assessment is sent over to the Mughal emperor, all right? But that was not the only source of revenue. There were also markets. So there were taxes as they are taxes placed to, today they're called excise taxes, right? And I think you know that excise taxes on such things as alcohol and tobacco uh, and sometimes luxury goods are higher. So the, the uh, uh, excise tax on alcohol once you add it to all the other taxes is one reason why alcohol becomes expensive uh, and why uh, 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 alcohol is a big source of revenue. One reason why alcohol shops are open much earlier, for example, during the coronavirus pandemic in many countries of the world is because if the alcohol shops are closed uh, and bars are closed, the state everywhere, almost everywhere in the world loses a considerable amount of revenue. But they were at the Mughal markets were trading in such things as perfumes, cotton textiles, ivory cases, right? Uh, uh, and uh, the the um, the empire derived revenue from from all of these. So what I'm suggesting here is I'm giving you some hints about where the revenue was accumulated from, and if we take seriously what somebody like Irfan Habib is saying. What I'm also suggesting is that there's no question that there was probably exploitation of the peasantry. Uh, now, when people think about the Taj Mahal and when they think about not just the Taj Mahal because we look at other architectural works, uh, they're not looking at that part of the story. What they're seeing is what they think is this gorgeous monument to love, right? Okay, so we'll get back to the Taj in a moment. Here you see the emperor. The emperor. This is a one of those miniature paintings from that period. Um, you see the Mughal emperor. By and you, do you see you see this halo right over here. So this was this was something really a practice that was really adopted from Christian art. You didn't really ever get it uh, in Hindu art before. And and you would see, uh, you know, th these would be the two sons. I mean, he had more than two sons, but in this you see the two sons. Uh, of the emperor um, uh, and you know the courtiers over here um, and here is uh, another miniature which shows one of Shah Jahan's sons um, and that's 
over here, right over here. This is uh, Aurangzeb. Uh, so, you know, when I was, if you, you just go back to this for here for a moment, just so that you get the context, because I was talking about Shah Jahan and I was talking about, you know, his experience, right? Well, so the same thing is going to happen with his sons that he's going to put them, um, you know, give them positions of responsibility. This is a miniature painting which shows uh, 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 Aurangzeb uh, leading the Mughal forces, which includes elephants. Uh, uh, you know, you, what you're seeing here, of course, is a little fraction, right? Uh, uh, leading them to the capture of a city called Orcha, uh, which is in um, Madhya Pradesh in central India today. You can still see the ruins, some of the best, some of the best architectural ruins, um, um, and sometimes a little more than ruins in India that you can see anywhere in India are in Orcha. You know, all right. So here's the building that we're really talking about. You're seeing this from 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 behind, not from the front, because from the front, uh, the Taj, uh, you will see that 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 same pattern of that Persian garden. And I want you to take your mind back to the discussion I had about Babur uh, and the Char Bahag. Uh, you know, the 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 garden that was, uh, uh, you know, in four parts. Uh, as it were. So if you see it from the other side, that's how you would see the Taj. Uh, here's another view. So this is that side. So here you're only seeing two portions because if you see more of the foreground, if the photograph had been taken from much further behind, then you would see the other, the other uh, two as well. So the four parts, uh, the waterway, um, um, you know, and you know the water is also integral to this to the Persian garden as well as to the gardens that were built by uh, the Mughal emperors in um, in India. Um, now, I want to discuss the Taj and what I call its cultural politics and its cultural histories. Okay, I want to take about 10-15 minutes to do that uh, for the reasons that I've already described to you that this is the most iconic mo mo uh, uh, monument we have uh, from India. It's almost synonymous with India. It is probably the most well-known expression in stone of the idea of love, but we'll have to ask some serious questions. Uh, what does that really mean here, right? Um, and the, and the Taj continues to be controversial, uh, continues to come into discussions, everyday discussions in all kinds of ways. You know? So I'll give you uh, an illustration of some of the complexities before I start looking what I've written on the slides uh, over here, uh, because what I'm gonna mention is not mentioned in the slide. So you see, um, given the level of pollutions in India, um, you know, De Delhi and Agra and Kanpur right now all have a, you know, uh, AQI of 350, 400, something like that, way above uh, WHO recommended levels, um, you know, that would keep you safe. 50 is supposed to be the, the maximum. Yesterday it was 350. It's been 500 um, and some days ago. And and North India for 30, 40 years, that part of North India, uh, particularly Delhi, Agra is not really much better. It's, it's not as big as Delhi. So uh, comparatively, the sources of pollution may be, may be fewer. Uh, but then again, you have to remember that Delhi is a capital. So they try to keep the pollution levels down. So they try to ensure that unregulated industries are not working there, belching out smoke. Uh, and the smaller towns uh, in North India, it's the pollution levels are almost unthinkably high, right? So why am I mentioning all of this? Because um, 40 years ago, when I first read about it, uh, there was a petition that was put before the Supreme Court of India. And the petition was that, you know, around, not very far from where the Taj is, you have these stone crushers, okay, stone crushing industries. And I know exactly what 
this actually involves because we had a relative in the family who owned a stone crusher. And so, you know, the, the, these are stone crushers. So you take big boulders and you put them in a crusher and it crushes it. But, you know, when it crushes it, uh, because that, that crushed stone is then used, for example, partly to lay out roads uh, for other purposes. Uh, but when you crush it, then all of this dust and, you know, comes out. Okay. Um, uh, and, you know, the machines themselves are very often run with diesel, all kinds of things. So the gist of the matter is that the petition was that the Taj Mahal was being ruined. Uh, you know, there was all this soot that was falling on the Taj uh, and you should shut down these industries. Okay. Well, the problem is that there are 50,000, 100,000 people employed by these industries. Right? Now you see, you could simply say that, ah, the Taj is a glorious monument. You know, it's obscene to let this kind of pollution go on, uh, which I would agree with, right? But the objection here is not that this pollution is actually uh, causing respiratory problems for 500,000 people living in the city, which would be a much greater problem. Uh, and that is a problem. The, the objection was that it's actually ruining the Taj. Uh, now, some human rights activists who, uh, you know, some of whom may love the Taj and some of whom may, may be indifferent, who knows? But some of them pointed out, yeah, well, that's correct. But but what about the jobs of these 50,000, 100,000 people? Because what the petition sought to do was to, and was to tell the Supreme Court of India uh, uh, that you should weigh in on this matter and you should, you should uh, uh, pass a judgment uh, ordering the government of India to stop all this industry around the Taj to save the monument, right? So you see, it can, it, all kinds of questions of that kind can come up. And these are part of the, the history uh, of what we might call the monument itself. It's, it's one of India's largest revenue earners among tourist sites, especially. Uh, and this has always been a consideration for those who think about, you know, how do we balance the demands of the, the security for the Taj uh, and the demands that are made such as by these group of you know, activists on saying that, well, these stone crushers should not be working anywhere in the vicinity of the Taj, you know, all right. Uh, but, there are other, but there are other kinds of uh, instances where the Taj has gotten into political history. So when the Sikh secessionist movement was going on, uh, in the in the late 70s and the 1980s, the Sikh secessionists threatened to blow up the Taj, and they shut it down. They shut it down. The government, Indian government, just completely shut it down, which meant that they shut down their the monument that brought the greatest number of tourists, uh, because they were not uh, certain that they would actually be able to to protect this monument, right? And then, of course. People were saying, look how barbarous these terrorists are. They're threatening to, throw, throw, to, to destroy uh, what is uh, India's most famous uh, monument, right? Uh, but, you know, if you're a devout Sikh militant, uh, right, or a devout some other kind of militant, uh, why should the Taj matter? It's, it's, it's something that can be used as a way to negotiate uh, something that you want. So this is what I mean when I say that we'd have to look at all kinds of histories. But we're going to look at something actually quite different today because this concerns specifically the histories of the Taj, uh, uh, which has been, you know, commemorated by the greatest poets in India, including Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, this line of it of his appears uh, in so many histories where he characterized the Taj as the teardrop in the face of eternity, sometimes teardrop on the cheek of time. Uh, the poem in which it appears is called Shah Jahan in a collection called Balak, right? Uh, the Taj is a form of cultural capital for India itself, for the Indian government. It's, uh, that is, it, it earns India prestige. It just doesn't earn India money, it earns India a certain kind of prestige, right? Uh, and that's what I mean by cultural cultural capital. Now, given 
that that it's such a prestigious monument, such a famous monument, you may be surprised that there have actually been calls for its removal. And I'm speaking about calls for its removal in very recent years. So in 2017, uh, Yogi Adityanath, who is the chief minister of UP, he's dug out by Narendra Modi and put into power there. Uh, he's a rather notorious character, uh, Yogi Adityanath, if you've been following him, um, uh, because he's really a rabid, uh, uh, you know, a Hindu uh, extremist. Um, uh, and it obviously doesn't really have much of an appetite or taste for such things as culture. Um, uh, uh, human rights have been completely trampled to the ground, if you ask me, by, by Adityanath. Um, uh, and he's ferociously anti-Muslim, ferociously anti-Muslim, you know, right? So uh, he has said in 2017, the Taj, uh, Taj Mahal and other minarets do not reflect Indian culture, um, uh, do not reflect Indian culture. Notice the wording, right? Because what's happening here, this is a simplest illustration of where he's uh, conflating two terms, right? What, what he's really saying is Indian culture is Hindu culture because of course you would have to ask why isn't the Taj a part of Indian culture? It's been, the monument has been in India for close to 500 years, correct? Close to 500 years. It is what makes India well known in large parts of the world, right? It has given pride to all kinds of Indians for centuries. Right? What he is implying is Indian and Muslim are exclusive categories, right? Exclusive categories. If you're Muslim, you can't be Indian. Now in Uttar Pradesh, the tourism department released a brochure of tourist sites that omits the Taj. I mean, you're really surprising. I mean, it's like a tourist brochure for, for you know, California and the West and the entire West and doesn't mention the Grand Canyon, for example, okay? Just completely omits the Grand Canyon, right? If you were doing a tourist brochure of Arizona and didn't mention the Grand Canyon, I mean, it would seem rather bizarre frankly, right? But that's what it is. The tourism department was releasing brochures saying, uh, you know, mentioning other monuments, but not mentioning the Taj at all. And one BJP uh, politician uh, in 2017, when this co controversy arose, weighed in and said, quote, many people were worried that the Taj Mahal was removed from the list of historical places in the UP tourism booklet. So he's referring to what I said. What history are we talking about? The man who built Taj Mahal imprisoned his father. He wanted to massacre Hindus. If this is history, then it is very unfortunate and we will change his history, I guarantee you, right? So what he's doing there, of course, he's, he's making a number of claims. He wanted to massacre Hindus. Uh, did Shah Jahan want to massacre Hindus? Well, there's absolutely no evidence uh, that he's engaged in anything that you might describe as a massacre or genocide of Hindus. Uh, did he imprison his father? Did he imprison his father? Okay, the man who built Taj Mahal imprisoned his father. So he's 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 simply confused. But we can forgive this confusion because it was it was it was Aurangzeb who imprisoned his father Shah Jahan, right? So the man who built Taj Taj Mahal is Shah Jahan. He's being imprisoned by his son. All right, he's being imprisoned by his son. But it's not the it's not this confusion, it's not this technical error. It's this idea that, well, because you know, the Mughal emperor actually is the kind of person and the Mughal family people, they kill their own sons, uh, you know, sometimes imprisoned, a son would imprison his father, would you know, a person would become blinded, right? The sort of things that I spoke spoke to you about before. I would insist, number one that this kind of thing is not at all uncommon, right? It's not at all uncommon. Uh, and this doesn't really tell us anything very much 
about the Mughal emperors because this is the culture of those times to a very substantial degree. Now, I'm not exonerating it in the least, right? I'm not saying that there isn't a problem with it, but uh, you know, it's the problem of political succession. Uh, and until political succession is based on very clear principle, principles such as primogeniture where the eldest son gets it, gets the throne automatically, right? Or there's no competition. This is a problem in every empire all over the world, right? And, and the supposition that only the Muslims had this kind of problem is something that can't be sustained at all. So Hindutva's history of the Taj, right? Um, how do Hindu nationalists write this history? Uh, and very often what has been done, uh, and this is done by many historians, uh, whether they are nationalist historians or uh, you know, extremist historians or left-wing historians, they, they often they make a distinction, which is a distinction you find in everyday language between history and myth. All right, where history is shown as kind of this Promethean struggle against myth, this, this primordial great universal struggle against myth, All right? And I think we have to read the word myth very carefully here because there are at least two predominant ways in which we can think about it. There are multiple ways, but two major ways that we can think about it. One is when someone says something to you, okay? And, you know, oh, did you hear uh, that uh, Trump did such and such thing? So, you know, today was inauguration day and you know what the custom is, right? Uh, among presidents that before the president uh, leaves the White House for the last time, he leaves a handwritten note for his successor, okay? So the question was, has Trump left a hand note, handwritten note for Biden, considering that he, uh, considering that he uh, decided that he wouldn't even attend Biden's uh, inauguration and has considering that, that Trump has said that he doesn't uh, think that Biden won the election uh, you know, in a fair uh, manner, right? Uh, you know, stop the steal, right? That's been the slogan of the Trump, Trumpites. So, uh, so now the myth that's already going around is that, yeah, actually he left behind a, a typewritten note uh, where he wrote only one line in the middle of the letter saying, Joe, you know that I won this election, okay? So see, if this story... Pass. Now we don't know. This is this is not been established. It's already becoming a myth. That is something that is either a falsehood or something that can't be established, right? That's one predominant meaning of the word myth. The other is when we speak about such things as the Greek myths or the Hindu myths, you know. So when you when you read a story about Vishnu. Okay, uh, and and or you or you read a story about a god Shiva, uh, and Shiva did this or that, or Hanuman lifted a whole mountain, right? Those are Hindu myths. That is that they are a different way of comprehending the world around you. They are a different way of entering into the imagination we need to start thinking about certain things. All right, and what happens here? is in the case of a monument such as the Taj Mahal, is that people start using this word myth to basically designate the other person's version of what that monument is. So from the point of view of the Hindu nationalists, right, what we all believe about the Taj in ordinary life, all of that is a myth. All of that is a myth. It's been concocted, right? That's, that's the Hindu nationalist view. Now there's this man called P. N. Oak, who is going to begin to provide a new history of the Taj. So th this new history did not begin with the BJP five years ago. They've been, they've been doing that too. It goes back to the 1960s when this man, P. N. Oak, 
and a few of buddies of his found the Institute for Rewriting Indian History. Uh, Oak was from Indore, the MP region, Central India. He's a, he's a Brahmin. He spent some time in Agra. Uh, so he may have known, gone to the Taj many times. And he claims to have served in the Indian National Army with Subhash Bose uh, uh, in, the, in the 1940s. Um, that's not really been established. It's one way to win credibility is to say, ah, I fought alongside Subhash Bose, the great Subhash Bose. Um, so, he, so why am I bringing him into the picture? Because he says our institute is pledged among other things. He wrote in 1976 to rid Islamic history of the silly notion that Muslims, rulers, and courtiers who built no palaces built majestic and massive mosques and tombs. The world must know that those buildings are all pre-Islamic, right? So here you, begin, here you see the claim. He's saying that all the great Muslim monuments in India, all of them were actually Hindu monuments. And the Muslims came around and changed their history. All right, so he puts foreign scholars on notice that all historic buildings in India are captured Hindu buildings. And students of the Islamic period of Indian history are admonished to recognize the basic fact, the basic fact, as he puts it, that every temple, mansion, and fort overrun by Muslim invaders was advertised as a mosque tomb or citadel built by them. That these Muslims came, there were temples there, there were palaces, there were mansions, there were forts. When they defeated the Hindus, <coughs> they altered these buildings and then claimed that these buildings were their own. So here, look at the, look at the titles of some of his books. The Taj Mahal is a temple palace. Um, uh, Fatehpur Sikri is a Hindu city. Agra Red Fort is a Hindu building. This is Agra Red Fort is built by Akbar. Delhi's Red Fort built by Shah Jahan is Hindu Lal Court. The Taj Mahal is Tejo Mahalai, a Shiva temple. It's actually a Shiva temple, he's saying, all right? Um, and Lucknow's Imam Baras are Hindu palaces regarding which he said that they are conclusively proved in a research volume to be of holy and hori, hori, Ramayanic origin. They go back to the time of the Ramayana. So there, here is an illustration of uh, one of his books or big pamphlets. The Taj Mahal is Tejo Mahalia. So the claim here is that this was the original Hindu name. And then the Muslim emperors just came and they just did some cosmetic work. Uh, uh, you know, this was really a Shiva temple, and now they're claiming that they built this whole whole thing. Um, and you know, you think to yourself, this guy's a complete crackpot. Uh, you go to the internet and you'll find that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of trolls who are saying, hey, look at this. We were always saying that the Muslims are incapable of building anything. You know, they, they, they're incapable of having great architecture, uh, and they've basically stolen our heritage, our, uh, you know, our history, uh, all of that, all right? Uh, this is one of the buildings that is referred to. That's why I have a photograph here, uh, the Red Fort, uh, from, um, from where, from the ramparts of which uh, the prime minister addresses the country uh, every year, as you know, on, on, Independence, on Independence Day, uh, right, on, on August 15th. So uh, uh, this is built uh, during Shah Jahan's time uh, by Shah Jahan. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Uh, and this is the Divan e Khas. So in the Red Fort, uh, you have, uh, I'll get back to the Taj Mahal in just a moment, but just showing you a couple of slides here. So, you know, uh, in the Red Fort, you have uh, these, um, uh, you, you know, the Divan e Khas and the Divan e Am. So if you look at the, can you see the caption here as well? I'm assuming you can, right here, the note. I can, I can see that. Yeah. So divan e khas. So divan e khas is khas is for special people. So this is the reception hall for for the nobility, for for ambassadors, for his own sons. So when he would hold court there, uh, in the divan e khas, 
this was only for the elite. Uh, so ambassadors from foreign countries, uh, high-ranking generals, uh, high-ranking officials of the court where some of the court business would be conducted. When the emperor wanted to meet with the common people, he would receive petitions from the common people. And this is true not just of Shah Jahan, this is true of, of uh, 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 Jahangir uh, as well, right? Uh, what would they do? They would, they would, they would have uh, meetings with these common peoples, and then divane am, am here is common people. Khas is special, right? So that's a larger, that's a larger building, and it's called the divane am, and this is the divane am and the red fort of Delhi today. Uh, have you been to the red fort? Yes. Yeah. All right. So did, did anyone explain to you the buildings around there or you just walked on your own? I went many years ago. I think there was some explanation, but- yeah. Um, Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so this is the Divane Am and then the previous one is Divane Kas, right? That's a distinction between the two. And you can tell by the way, this is, this is more, you would agree, right? More plain. Uh, I mean, it's still beautiful architecture. And of course, much of it has been stripped of its glory. This has been almost entirely stripped of its glory, at least according to, if you look at the, the records, I mean, you see, for example, all this empty space here and, and you know, all of this would have been real jewels. All of that was taken out uh, by plunderers and looters, uh, you know, uh, over the century. Uh, so, but uh, uh, in, inlaid work, uh, so it's it's a pale shadow of itself, but but still you can see it's far more elaborate uh, than the, the than the divane arm uh, and also smaller in size, uh, the divane khas. So here is now another the Indian conspiracy. I mean, th this is this is uh, this is uh, uh, you know something you'll find on the uh, on the internet uh, uh, all over if you if you look carefully. Um, now, you know, you, you but might- are there, but, but are there um, a lot of people who subscribe to these theories? There are enough people that these things start, started, start to get taken seriously. You have to see if, if so let's say if you ask me randomly, what percentage of people, okay? Oh, I'd say minuscule, minuscule, okay? It could be 1%, for example, 2%, all right? So, you know, if you're looking at it, the totality of it is nothing, but this is how you have to look at it. Number one, things like that always start with small numbers. How many people believed in the ideas of Adolf Hitler in the beginning? A handful. A handful. Then he gathers another 100, 200 followers. Then it's 500. Then before you know it, he has a party of 20,000 people. And within a year, he has won an election as chancellor. A lot of people think, by the way, that somebody like Hitler simply orchestrated a coup. No, he, he, he actually wins an election. I mean, that's how he comes to power. And of course, by the time of the war, the entire German nation is complicit in the most crackpot ideas you've ever heard of, right? So, so the question you're asking is legitimate, but the answer is far more complex because one, we could say the numbers are probably very small. No one's ever done a survey and said, hey, let me take a thousand Indians and see how many of them actually believe in this. It may be a lot more than I'm saying. I don't think that more than, it'll be more than a few per percentage points, but that's not the main issue for the reason I've already described. Things begin in a certain way, and then they can, the number two, and they can, you know, they, they can build up uh, and it can become a real problem. Because number two, you have to ask yourself, how does a single person come to believe in a completely crackpot theory like this? Because it's absolute rubbish absolute rubbish. Having said that, I don't for a moment deny, in fact, I myself had raised the idea of what I call spoliage. You may remember that, but that's a very different idea. 
And that idea of spoliage is that there is evidence that particularly in those times that when you have a conqueror going through an area of a different religion than the people who are being conquered, when that conqueror or new emperor, new ruler builds some structures, particularly religious structures, they take the remains of the structures they've destroyed, okay? So you, let's say five, the Kutub Minar complex, it has been argued that there may be the remains of 20 Hindu temples, the rubble, the rubble, okay? The dust and the stone and small bits and pieces from 20 different temples that were taken and were then used, okay, to build a Muslim monument. And, of, and it's being done not simply uh, because, hey, why throw away all of this rubble? Let's use it constructively. It's not just recycling. What you're doing is you're showing by using that, you're showing that you're absorbing the enemy within yourself. Okay, you have defeated them. You have taken over them. You have taken over their being in a way. So, th so that spoliage has meaning, all right? But it was done commonly, but, this, but that's not the claim here. This is not spoliage. They're not saying... That, that actually these people, pe people like Oak, they're not saying that these uh, buildings were, were you know, rubble, uh, okay, and that there were 10 or one or five Hindu temples. They're saying actually this building was a Hindu temple. It's just been converted into an Islamic one through some cosmetic changes, okay? That's what they're saying. And the, the other part of the claim is that that's because they're saying, hey, Muslims don't know how to actually build such great monuments. It's imp impossible that Muslims could have done that. Well, obviously, Oak doesn't know the history of, you know, uh, the thousands of great Muslim monuments in Samarkand, Herat, Kandahar, Uzbekistan, you know, Iran, all of that, right? Unless he thinks that all of that was all part of Hindu India, you know, right? So... You know, one could one could one could offer many uh, 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 arguments to say that it's not the number of people who believe in this that really matters. What really matters is how this kind of discourse has become part of the public domain, because it has. That's the problem, and and of course, and now under conditions of the kind of social media that we have, this becomes much more common, much more prolific, all right? And I just realized that I actually had two other slides here, which I didn't include, which showed two other uh, of the headings of his uh, uh, pamphlets. But here, look at this one here. Um, I still have a few more things to say about the Taj. Uh, but uh, if you look at this over here, so, you know, he says, you look at the dome over here, uh, it's a trident pinnacle, uh, which is really what he says a Hindu Hindu uh, uh, you know trident looks like, uh, non-rusting eight metal Hindu alloy, uh, and he says it also served as a lightning uh, deflector. So he's saying that the Hindus had great science, uh, and it was actually a way to deflect uh, uh, lightning. All right, uh, and he says that you know everyone thinks that this is a uh, Islamic uh, crescent and star, um, but frankly, really, this building was actually, you know, a well-established Hindu temple, and they just came along, uh, the Mughals, and then just simply made these very small cosmetic changes, and then added the calligraphy. Uh, uh, all right, uh, and he's saying that this shows really that almost all the historians have been very lazy; they haven't done their work. Okay, uh, that's that's really is going to be his claim. Uh, so, you know, if you ask tough questions like, okay, so uh, how about all the extensive account books that we have, okay, uh, from Shah Jahan's time, all of which have been authenticated, okay, which show, which mention the Taj Mahal, mention its construction, how many people were paid, how much they were paid, evidence running into reams and reams of pages. He says it's all made up. It's all made up. So then if you ask him, how about all the European witnesses? Oh, the Europeans colonized us. They were intent on putting, on putting the Hindus in their place. You know, uh, it was a Semitic religion, so they favored Islam. 
the, the, that's his, that, that, that's the explanation. So you can't really take it seriously as an argument. You have to take it seriously as an indication of where the country is going. If people start becoming captive to this way of thinking, what are the consequences, right? Now there is a lot of anxiety over the Taj, both among the Hindus and the Muslims. That's the other interesting thing. The anxiety among Hindu nationalists, you can see that, and you can see that, and 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 that slide you just saw, you can see that obviously, for example, and what I've mentioned over here, particularly what Aditya Nath is saying, they don't, ref, the, you know, the Taj doesn't reflect Indian culture, and then this other great BJP politician, major important major uh, BJP politician, saying, well, you know, uh, this man, the person who built it, you know, he wanted to massacre Hindus, right? Uh, see, th this is a building that th these people are saying is really an embarrassment, okay? It's an embarrassment, uh, right? They have a, this certain, and of course, on the other hand, it's a bit of an embarrassment because the greatest monument to love among those Hindus, nationalists who say, yes, we do recognize this is a great monument, all of that, but it's Islamic. Right? I mean, how come how come it was a foreign? Because the whole claim is that these people are foreigners. So how come the greatest monument really goes back to the time of a foreigner? Right? And one scholar has pointed out, I cannot verify this, okay, because I haven't checked to see, and that would be it would take a bit long time to do that check to see whether this claim is true. But one scholar has claimed that the archeological survey, which has been in existence since 1861, has never published a guidebook to the monument, uh, which would be very odd because I've been to the archeological survey and, I've, and I've, I must have a hundred of their guidebooks, uh, which you can buy at monuments. And, sh and this scholar says that the archeological survey, which has been run by Hindus, especially of course, since independence, they've never published a guidebook. It's like they would like people to forget about it. Among Muslims, it's controversial because if you're an Orthodox Muslim, all right, somebody like Aurangzeb, let's say, then, then these tombs are a controversial issue in Islamic tradition because these tombs are a form of idolatry. Now, yes, there is no image of Mumtaz Mahal, no image or painting in the in the Taj itself or of Shah Jahan, okay, or any of the other members of the family that may be buried there, all right? Uh, but the monument itself is a form of idolatry according to the orthodox way of thinking. Now, if you, if you think that that's an exaggeration, consider the fact, just consider the fact that the Saudis, and I have mentioned, on more than one occasion that the, that the state of Saudi Arabia is a Wahhabi state. So this is the most orthodox form of Sunni Islamic thinking, okay? Extremely orthodox. Um, they have eradicated even the tombs of members of the family of the prophet that survived. In the last 15, 20 years, they have eradicated almost all of these tombs because they say anything, okay, which can be viewed as representational or as a monument to a person, all of that is un-Islamic, un-Islamic. Right, so they, so, so the, so even members of the prophet's own family who were commemorated, and with certain tombstones, all of those have been wiped out by the Wahhabis. You know, all right. So this is what I meant, what I mean when I say that these among Orthodox Muslims, these tombs are signs of idolatry, a religion, a heathen faith, non-Islamic, and then of course this one is really a monument to you know to romantic love, right? Which, which is something that is even more unacceptable from this point of view. That I'm saying there's some degree of anxiety over it. Now, there are a few other questions. 
uh, which you would typically not addressed in the, in in the in in the books. I mean, and I myself have mentioned this repeatedly, but now I'm questioning the way in which I'm asking this when I speak about the greatest monument to love and all of that. Well, what do we really mean by that? Because what kind of love did Shah Jahan bear for his wife, Um Mumtaz? Right? Now, the way she died, she, she, she pre her death precedes that of uh, Shah Jahan, her husband, by, by many years. Right? She dies many years before he dies. And it said that when she died, he was so heartbroken that he decided at that point. So, you know, he goes into isolation for a while. And then when he comes out of it, he decides that he's going to build the, 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 the most grandiose monument in history in the world to his wife's memory. That's going to become the, the Taj Mahal. All right. Now, how did she die? She died while in childbirth while bearing his 14th child, 14th, all right? She couldn't have been um, more than, at that point, she couldn't have been more than 40 years old. If she was 40 years old, she may have been younger. I mean, this woman was virtually pregnant all the time. She was just, you know, there's, it's, it's very often when a woman, uh, you know, after she's um, born a child, then for a few months after that, she's breastfeeding uh, and all of that. And during that period, she usually is not going to get pregnant anyhow. But it's but many of these women, by the way, did not breastfeed their own children because as in aristocratic families in Europe, which was very common, exceedingly common, you had wet nurses. Uh, there were there were other women who would breastfeed the child. Um, um, uh, of uh, a woman such as the queen uh, or a princess or a noble woman, right? Uh, so she, so why did he subject her to pregnancy all the time, right? You think about it. I mean, so in other words, see, we're using a very idea of modern love when we say, oh, great monument to our love and all of that. Um, but we also understand that a person who's subjecting his wife to 14 pregnancies and she died during the 14th four in childbirth, it's quite likely that she probably would have born another six at that rate for all you know. And, and some people say, oh, we know the answer. That's because most of them didn't survive. You know, and in, 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 in those times, large families were very common. Well, here are two comments. One, yes, large families were common, but not that many children. Okay, and she's a, she a member of the aristocracy. She's after all the queen, right? Uh, the empress, the consort of the emperor, rather I should say. Um, and in her case, a large number of the children did survive. Large number, yes, there were a number of children who were lost in infancy, but at least nine of them survived. Okay, and survived into well beyond adolescence, right? So, I would say, I, I think we should question this idea of romantic love and his purported love. I mean, I'm not saying that I have another reading of what was happening, but and I think we need to also be able to, to say he was very much a patriarchal figure in his own way. Women were simply childbearing machines. You see, now, if you say that they're childbearing machines, that puts a different twist on what kind of love he had for her. Because I think they clearly understood the risk of pregnancy at that time. They, these people would have seen it happen among women in the family and the extended you know, court uh, because maternal mortality and infant mortality rates were much higher in those days, much, much higher. You know, right? So it's, it's just worthwhile thinking about it. That's what I'm saying. Right? Now, there's a story that's been told that Shah Jahan planned to have a second Taj. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but this is a, one of the most common stories told about the Taj. So when we do a history, we also should think about what kind of stories circulate in people's minds, whether they have a factual basis or not. Because if that story is circulating widely, it tells us something about the imagination of the people, all right? And, and, and he planned to have a second Taj built 
for him across the Yamuna in, in black. So it had to be black, uh, as I say, because that's how you would get the symphony of black and white. Right? Uh, and of course, if you did it in white, then, then the one that he had built for her would not be singular. The whole idea was that it should be singular. Uh, but even doing it in black, if it was going to be in exactly the same monument, would seem to take something away from the dignity of the first, you know, right? So uh, that's an interesting problem to think about. How does one assess a story of that kind? Uh, I heard a story from uh, my father, and then I've encountered it in dozens of places uh, in subsequent years. I heard it from my father when I was in my teens. Uh, and that story was that he had the arms of his architect amputated so that this architect would be unable to build such a grandiose monument for someone else. Um, at that time, it didn't occur to me when I was, I think, 12 or 13, when I heard the story, it didn't occur to me that if you, if you um, um, amputate the arms of the architect, that doesn't prevent the architect from uh, building another Taj, because if the if the architect done, done the first one, there would be plans for it and you don't need arms. You can always have someone else, you know, flip the plans for you or whatever it is. Uh, so clearly the story that's been circulating, which is I think purely apocryphal, that is that there's no basis for it, but is really widespread in the literature. There are variants of it. Uh, and you see these variants tell you a little bit about how the, how especially middle-class Indians were thinking about the Mughals, okay? So in this one variant, Shah Jahan directs the architect be killed, all right? Uh, not amputate, not just have the arms amputated, but killed. Uh, another variant says that uh, all the 20,000 workers on completion of the Taj were blinded, maimed or put to death, okay? Uh, which the idea being that a one single worker who had worked there for, let's say, years would have enough knowledge of it that he could help an architect reconstruct this. So, so you know, this is the this is the theory of Oriental despotism. The Oriental despot never will permit, uh, okay, people who in any way could undermine the singularity of his power, okay, in some way. So. Here, this is a story of an oriental, and, and sometimes oriental despots just act out of sheer madness. There's no reason, right? That, that's what these stories are really sort of pointing to, okay? Uh, who is the architect? A lot of people claim, well, we actually have a pretty good idea, but you know, a Venetian architect has often been mentioned in the connection, the Florentine influence, influence from Florence has been detected and the Pietra Dura, the Pietra Dura is the inlaid gemstones, right? But uh, it seems that the main architect was in fact a man called Ustad Ahmed Lahori. Uh, the surname here should indicate to you where the person came from, from Lahore, uh, from uh, in, in present day Pakistan, just across the border from India, right? Uh, that's, what I would, that's what I would say. So here's another look at the Taj, the reflecting pool. Uh, think about it for a moment because You've seen it and you lived in Washington, DC, uh, or at least visited it. And that's where they got the idea from, from, from the Taj. Uh, if you know, if you've been to the, the mall in Washington, DC uh, and the monument there, uh, uh, right? That there's a reflecting pool and, and they got that idea from, from the Taj. So, uh, that's the reflecting pool over here. There's a very elaborate kind of, uh, uh, discussion of other aspects of the Taj, but I think I've said really as much as I want to say. Let me finish up with Shah Jahan in just a few minutes and then I'll pause um, uh, to see if you have a few, you know, any question and then we move on to, to uh, uh, Aurangzeb and the Marathas whom I'm going to take together. So uh, as I said, his greatest legacy is Shah Jahanabad, um, other than the Taj Mahal, uh, which is uh, uh, what is today called Old Delhi, which was a planned city, a planned city. So it, in, it included, uh, you know, that Chandni Chok, right, uh, in, in, in Old Delhi, 
uh, which is completely different. So one of the projects of the government now, uh, I, I, you may know about it, is to transform it, transform it back into what it looked like uh, 300, 350 uh, years ago, uh, right? So uh, Shah Janabad is a city that he that he's going to build. Uh, this underscores the importance of Delhi that I've talked to you about uh, on a number of occasions before, the Delhi Sultanate. You know, during that time, uh, many of the sultans would establish a new capital in Delhi itself. So Delhi actually is the site of many different capitals. And of course, of course, the last two of those great capitals were the one built by the British when they changed, when they shifted their capital from, Calc from Calcutta to Delhi and built what is called Lucian's Delhi, that is those great buildings that we have, uh, uh, including the Lok Sabha, the Parliament Building, you know, uh, uh, Rajpath, uh, Janpath, that whole complex, and the uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan, the President's Palace, that all of that is the built by the British. And then, of course, we have now uh, an attempt being made by the present government to build a new complex there, right? You can see, you see, now I hope you understand better why someone like the Prime Minister of India is intent on doing it, because in a way he's acting like one of these Oriental monarchs, okay, uh, including the British, uh, who acted like an Oriental monarch, so to speak. That is that if you want to establish yourself as the great ruler, you build a capital in Delhi, right? And so the Delhi has been the site of multiple cities. Tughlaqabad, that's, you know, going back to the time of Feroz, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Mohammed Tughlaq, and then of course, uh, Feroz Shah Kotla, another capital, right? right? So they've been several. So he starts, has work started on a new city, which starts in April, 1639. It's nine years in the making, a little bit more than nine years in the making. He enters it when it's completed on 19th April, 1648. Um, at the Eastern end is the Red Fort, which still stands. Uh, we've seen photographs before. Its walls are three kilometers in circumference. The backside of the Red Fort is where the Yamuna flows. Uh, uh, and within this complex, you had a huge number of buildings, two of which we saw very briefly uh, within the Red Fort, that is. Uh, but the Red Fort itself is part of Shah Jahanabad uh, because you also have the Jama Masjid, the Great Friday Mosque. Uh, this is an image of the Jama Masjid here, uh, which at the time when it was built would have been, um, um, you know, one of the two or three largest mosques. Uh, in the world. I think that there are now some larger ones built, especially by the Saudis. Uh, so, you know, what, what is called Old Delhi is really the capital that was built. That part of it is, uh, is, is Shah Janabad built, um, as I said, at the orders of Shah Jahan. And this is another photograph of the, the Great Friday Mosque. Okay, we'll get to that other building in just a moment. Uh, and as I said to you, within that, you have the Divane, within the fort, then you have the the Divane Khas, uh, Divane Am. So if you're thinking about what are the great buildings there, so it'll be the Red Fort um, and all the buildings in that complex. Uh, and then there'll be obviously the Jama Masjid, the Friday Mosque, and then Chandni Chok, the great shopping arcade. Okay, uh, and, and what is really the heart of old Delhi, you know, today. Uh, in the, at the Divane Khas, he had the words inscribed, if there be a paradise on earth, it is this, it is this, it is this. You can still see it inscribed there. Uh, what was the population of Delhi around that time? Outside the fort, the population would have been around 400,000. And within the fort, not at the time when it was completed, but, but in, in a few years, it would have been somewhere in the vicinity of 55, 60. So, you know, you're talking about a population of half a million, which would have made Delhi one of the, one of the largest and greatest cities in the world um, at that time. Uh, today, it is the largest city in the world population-wise, 
by a small fraction over a number of other cities. It's actually the largest city population wise in the world, according to some uh, indicators is, uh, you know, uh, Bombay is very close. And then you have obviously cities like Tokyo and, and Cairo and others. Uh, but but uh, uh, certainly at that time, it would probably, I can't say it for sure, I'd have to check the figures against London, Paris, Baghdad, and so on, but the largest city most likely at that time. Okay, um, uh, I'm pretty much finished with this, except a few more slides that I wanna show you here. And then we move on to uh, Shah Jahan's sons uh, uh, and uh, look at uh, Dada Shiko, uh, Aurangzeb, uh, and the Marathas. And so this is the tomb of Itmadu Dola. Uh, that is the father-in-law of Jahangir. Uh, so the father of Noor Jahan, this architect, architecture goes back to this time as well. Uh, this is viewed by many people, by the way, as actually in terms of the, the quality of the work, this is not a very clear slide here, but in terms of the quality of the work, it's viewed as equivalent to the Taj, if not better, much smaller, of course, uh, so he was, uh, of course, a great um, uh, noble at the court, as I said, the father of, of Noor Jahan, right? Um, so the, here's, here's a slide which shows you some of the work uh, uh, th that you find uh, at the Taj, uh, the kind of, and again, notice no, no figurative representation, no figures, right? I mean, in Islamic art, you'll either have the calligraphy or, the, or you'll have these patterns, geometric patterns, they may be floral patterns, you know, and you find that both in Itmada Dola, you also find it inside the Taj. This would be a typical uh, work uh, of, from that period. So these stone, uh, uh, you know, some in this case marble windows, but you get stone windows as well. Um, you find you find it in Venice as well, but this work here is just absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, you know, a very very fine, gorgeous work. Um, and here's the calligraphy right here. You can see that. So the calligraphy would usually be verses from um, verses from the Quran, uh, most typically. You know, all right. Uh, and uh, this is the inlaid marble work, characteristic of the high. Uh, Mughal period found both, as I said, at the Itmadu Dola uh, and uh, at the at the at the Taj. Okay. And, and Any these, questions? Yeah, th these miniature paintings um, are they consistent with the Islamic view of no idolatry? No, no, they are not. But you see, but that, but but the 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 the, the uh, um, uh, you know, emperors such as uh, uh, Akbar, uh, Jahangir, all of these, they, they, they were people who were very, Shah Jahan, they were very ecumenical. Okay, they were very ecumenical. Uh, the question is a very good one. It's a very good one because, of course, then it goes back to, doesn't it? It goes back to the period of Persian painting too. So, so, when I said, no, they are not, I can modify that very easily. I can modify it by saying that, you see, there is nothing in the tradition which prevents you from doing representational art, which is not linked to the figure of the prophet. Okay? The, right? Notice that these miniature paintings are never showing Muhammad, they're not showing the prophet of Islam. They're not showing members of the family, right? So that would be the easiest way um, because, because the tradition obviously goes back to, you recall this, the, recall the, 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 the miniature paintings that we saw uh, much early on when we were discussing the Timurids, these, right? These going back to the 1400s. Because I said this was the tradition that, that in a sense, Babur inherited. All right. 
Um, so here you are seeing figures here, right? You're seeing figures over here, but they're illustrating stories, uh, all of that. So the easiest explanation would be that even these are not dealing with, with representational art, uh, uh, I mean, with, with, the, with the prophet, uh, uh, with Muhammad and the family, uh, but the, uh, from the point of view of a very orthodox, very orthodox um, Muslim, uh, even these might have been a problem, but that was not really an issue for the court uh, and for the painters, because uh, for one thing, I've already indicated to you the tenor of their thinking. All right, what was the nature of their thinking? You know, the experimentation is in the case of, and wait until we get to Dara Shiko in just, you know, five, 10 minutes, uh, uh, a profound in investment in trying to understand the nature of Hindu philosophy, uh, long interactions with Hindu saints, with fakirs, with all of that. And then of course, there's a Sufi tradition. So some Muslims would say that actually we don't even accept this view uh, about uh, Islam that has been perpetrated by people which I've been talking about because they'll say that uh, Sufi, uh, the Sufis uh, will embrace art music, literature, but you don't find representation of the prophet, though, although in Iran, uh, even that's not true. Among the Shias, I, I mean, I remember going to uh, the, the, the home of uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, okay? So uh, the person who led the revolution uh, in 1979, which brought down the Shah. So his house in Tehran is now a kind of like a, a little state memorial. Um, and there, uh, you know, I, I saw a, 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 a painting of this very young person looking like, a, almost like Christ and I said, Who's a, and they said, this is the prophet. I said, yeah, but you know, uh, how come you have a representation? I thought this was completely abhorrent. And they said, well, yeah, not, not among us, you know, I mean, you know, we, we are okay with this. Uh, but, and this was at the, this was at the, uh, the birth, the, the home, uh, uh, you know, of uh, 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 Khomeini, the person who had led the Islamic revolution, okay? So you know, I think that, you know, all of these things uh, are not as straightforward uh, as they seem, but certainly I think the shortest answer here is that these works are not engaging in representation certainly of uh, Muhammad, because that I think, at least among the Sunnis is I think completely out of the question. 